we begin in the salvage company Agra's office. After 11 years of service, Vincent Robinson, Jude Law, has just been informed that he will be let go. The business has changed, according to his HR representative, so they no longer require submarines or submarine pilots to search for salvage. He is one of their best employees, so it has nothing to do with his work ethic. He was able to receive a severance payment of £8,640 after the HR representative spoke with some of his superiors. Robinson is asked if he has a pension or private savings by the salesperson. Robinson cuts him off by saying that he has more than 30 years of experience in subs and that he spent 11 years working for Agra. Due to his commitment to the job, he lost his family. Robinson is uncomfortably informed by the HR representative that they expect him to clear his desk by the end of the day. Old family photos are all that await Robinson when he gets home to his tiny, depressing apartment. Robinson makes an effort to be proactive in looking for a new job, but it is obvious that he is up against too many men who are similar to himself and that his heart isn't in it. He is questioned about his 15 years in the Navy and the reason he left. He says, I had a disagreement with someone. Robinson observes Chrissy, his ex-wife, pick up his son from school while keeping a close eye on him. Robinson observes with longing. Robinson is later seen at a bar with his friend Kirsten, Daniel Ryan, who was also let go by Agra. Kirsten tells Robinson he knows a way to make a lot of money and finally live the lives they deserve after going on for a while about their lot in life. Robinson visits a sizable mansion where he is greeted by Daniels, a lawyer. Scoot McNary Robinson is instructed by Daniels to only ask direct questions and not to inquire about Mr. Lewis's, Tobias Menzies, willingness to invest money or desire for it. Daniels cringes as Robinson asks Lewis those two questions the moment he sees him. Daniels describes what they are looking for during breakfast. The German economy was on the verge of collapse in 1940. Following the signing of a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, Hitler requested from Stalin a gold loan of 80 million Reichsmarks. According to legend, Hitler dispatched a U-boat, loaded it with gold, and then it capsized at sea. A few weeks later, Germany disregarded the agreement and began making preparations for an invasion by Russia. Though some claim Stalin granted the loan request and the gold is still somewhere, the purported gold was forgotten about. Robinson is informed by Daniels that the sub appears to be in the Black Sea and that, with his assistance, they can retrieve the gold secretly from there. Lewis is informed by Robinson that he will require a submarine, which will be quite expensive. The machines will be labeled in Russian, so he will also need Mina Euro, at least 12 of them a Euro, who are half British and half Russian to translate. Robinson is informed by Lewis that he will receive 40% of the first $40 million and 20% of any additional funds. Robinson accepts the conditions after being taken aback. Robinson is deliberating over which men to include in the expedition with Daniels and one of his other men. Reynolds, Michael Smiley, Gittens, Branwell Danage, a seaman with a slight gambling addiction, and Fraser, Ben Mendelssohn, one of the best divers Robinson knows but who Robinson admits is quite a psycho, are among the men they will take. They intend to approach the U-boat and don diving gear to approach it. Daniels hangs up the phone furiously. He appears to be compelled to join the crew in order to ensure that everything goes according to plan. When Robinson returns home, Tobin, Bobby Schofield, a young man, is waiting for him. He claims to be Kirsten's friend, who recently died by suicide. When Robinson speaks with Tobin in his apartment, he discovers that Kirsten overdosed on his antidepressant medication. 
ostensibly to ensure that his family received the insurance payout. As a child, Kirsten reportedly kept an eye on Tobin and was friendly with him. Robinson is upset that he is now one man short for the trip and is in shock over the death of his friend. He inquires about Tobin's age after observing him. Tobin claims to be 18. Robinson asks if Tobin sleeps hard after noticing how hungry he is, i.e. homeless or under severe financial stress. Observing something in the young boy, he then inquires as to Tobin's experience at sea. Sevastopol, Crimea, now serves as the new location. An old and rusted submarine is taken out for a crew by a guide. As he laughs, the guide turns to face the boat. He says in Russian, boats are like whores, the old ones know how to look after you best. Robinson enters the submarine and starts looking around. He eventually discovers three orange suits and hides them. Very important later. He orders the men to start putting the boat on the water. The men start putting supplies on the boat. Tobin is disliked by every man but Robinson, so they play a practical joke on him by assigning him to clean the chimney and wash the sub's windows. They all laugh when Robinson realizes what they did. The joke, according to Robinson, was a good thing because it showed that they liked Tobin. The oldest person on board, Peters, informs Robinson of the sub's condition, they have 70% battery power, a working diesel engine. Though it has a leak that the engineer is having trouble locating, and one radio circuit if things go wrong. Peters observes that as a result, if things start to go wrong, there is no way out. Daniels protests and inquires as to whether they might use the diving suits to flee. They could go 80 feet outside, Fraser smirks, but the suits aren't made to reach the surface. They perish if they sink. Peters informs Robinson that Tobin is disliked by the Russians, who refer to him as a virgin because of his youth and lack of maritime experience. Robinson orders Tobin to remain and to call a crew meeting so that everyone is aware of their objectives. Robinson informs the crew that they are searching for a lost U-boat that is loaded with gold, with one of the Russians translating for the other half of the crew. The majority of the gold they find goes to their benefactor, the rest is theirs. Every man will receive an equal share of the gold, as Robinson makes clear, surprising them all. Daniels pulls Robinson aside and inquires as to why he didn't simply pay them a small percentage as Robinson orders them to make final diving preparations. Robinson claims that because every man is risking everything for this mission, they all receive an equal share. What occurs when someone begins to believe that their share increases as more people leave the company? Daniels queries for even implying that his men would turn to murder in the name of greed, Robinson almost hits Daniels. One of the Russians informs Robinson that Zetsev, Sergei Poskepolis, the engineer, has rejected Tobin's assistance. The man is instructed by Robinson to inform Zetsev that he must cooperate with Tobin or get the fuck off my boat. How Tobin can assist Zetsev is explained to him. Despite being overburdened, he is ready to take the necessary action. The Russian and British crews are starting to develop tension during the dinner break. Fraser complains that the Russians receive an equal share because he believes the Russians are making fun of him. He then spits his stew on the table and insults the cook. When Robinson sees Tobin looking at something on his phone, he invites him to take a look. It is a picture of a baby, as Robinson can see. Robinson is aware that Tobin will soon become a father and is working at this job to support his child. Robinson reassures Tobin, your boy won't want for anything, and tells him not to worry. Tobin is taken aback by Robinson's knowledge of the gender and grows more open to the idea. Then, Robinson chuckles and claims that he informed the men that Tobin wasn't a virgin. 
When Robinson tells Tobin to keep quiet about the label, Tobin starts to object. The men and Robinson turned off the boat. Barber, the Sona specialist, informs Robinson that a Russian destroyer is nearby. The men wait motionless for it to pass. Robinson gives the order to start the boat at a slower speed for an hour before continuing as usual after that. In the sleeping quarters, Tobin and Reynolds are discussing the mission. Reynolds compares himself and the other guys to penguins, saying they are graceful and alive in the water but useless on land. What will Reynolds do with his share? Tobin queries. Reynolds promises to settle his debts and contribute a little to his family. Tobin is abruptly thrown off his bunk by the Russian crew, who enter the room and claim he is on the Russian side. All of this is observed by Fraser, who observes that they are doing it to enrage them and perhaps break Tobin in the process. Fraser smolders in his rage. They have located the diesel leak, and Robinson is now free to move on to other tasks. However, Robinson points out that the diesel engine needs to be fixed first. Robinson is informed that the British crew is protesting because they feel the Russians are taking an excessive amount of the gold. Robinson needs to emphasize that each man receives an equal share once more. Robinson overhears Gittens and a few of the men fighting in the dining area. He finds out that Gittens wants to leave and has a winning lottery ticket worth £30,000. Robinson inquires as to how he knows he won and discovers that he used the radio. He attacks the radio with an axe before setting fire to Gittens' ticket in front of him. Gittens is told that he is a fool for putting them all at risk for just £30,000 when they are after millions. Then he clearly states his stance once more, every man gets an equal share. Daniels observes the developing issues with concern. Fraser plays with his knife while sitting in the sleeping quarters. Then, in an effort to start something, he moves to the engine room. When Tobin accidentally turns a knob the wrong way while working with Tsitsev in the engine room, Tsitsev is burned by fluids. When Tsitsev starts to rush him, the Russian translator stops him. Fraser enters, engages in combat, and then stabs the translator to death. Gittens enters and demands to know what Fraser did because he is shocked. In the commotion, a bucket of diesel fuel leaks, sparks on the engine, causes an explosion that kills Gittens, and the sub to dive. Robinson is completely out cold by the shock, which jolts everyone. Robinson daydreams of his family relaxing on the beach in happier times. Then, as he grew estranged from his wife a Euro, who had grown weary of his long hours at work a Euro, she started to argue with him in front of their son. Robinson asserted that she was more concerned with financial security than having a husband present when they eventually got divorced. It would seem that Robinson is undertaking the expedition in part to support his family. A nasty gash is visible on Robinson's head when he awakens in his sleeping quarters. He spits out while turning to his side. He sees one of the dead men's body when he looks up. He quickly spots the other. The sub is submerged at the bottom of the sea. Robinson finds out that they have roughly 36 hours of power left and that the sub is essentially shot. The Russians have moved to the other side of the submarine after Fraser killed two people. The Russian crew has the water, but the British crew has the food, so soon one side will triumph over the other. Are we going to pass away? Tobin queries in fear. Robinson responds, no. Robinson tries to speak some Russian as he makes his way down the hallway. He says it again after spotting Morozov, Grigory Dobrogin. Robinson then realizes he can speak English after Morozov inquires as to what he is attempting to say. No one had ever questioned his ability to do so. The boat needs to be repaired collaboratively according to Robinson, and what Fraser did won't be forgotten. 
Robinson, however, is dependent on Barber to operate the sonar in order to escape their predicament. Robinson succeeds in persuading the Russians to declare a ceasefire, at least temporarily. Robinson concludes that if they can locate the U-boat, they can steal its drive shaft, retrofit it to their submarine, and get it operating once more. Since there is no oxygen decay in the Black Sea at their depth, the component ought to be intact. Robinson instructs Fraser and Peters to dispose of the corpses by emptying the torpedo tubes. Barbara uses an enormous metal object as an improvised sonar device to thwack on the ship's hull and determine their location. Zitsev threatens Fraser, saying he will eat his liver when they clean up their mess. Fraser says they'll deal with that when the time is right, and appears to understand that he is being threatened. Robinson and Morozov are aware that they might be on the incorrect canyon or just 100 meters away from the missing U-boat. Robinson makes the decision to look either way because, if they don't, they will already be dead. But he needs divers. Fraser is there, but he really needs three. Fraser approaches Peters despite his advanced age, and when forced to identify a third man, Tobin steps forward because he has experience scuba diving. Robinson instructs Tobin to put on his gear and pay close attention to Fraser because he is an expert in his field. Fraser is urged by Robinson to complete his task properly because they only have one chance. Tobin, Fraser, and Peters exit the submarine and dive into the water. The torpedo tubes fire the tools they require at them. On the sub, Peters positions a light. Tobin spots one of the dead bodies as Fraser and Tobin start to move in the direction of where the sub might be, almost falling off a cliff and only being saved by the oxygen line. Fraser just in time helps him stand back up. Peters is building a car to transport the drive shaft close to the sub. The ocean bottom rises as they make their way to the destination. Fraser believes they are trapped in the incorrect canyon and are therefore doomed. Robinson feels defeated, but Tobin sees something and looks more closely. As he starts to sift through the sand, he discovers a Nazi swastika. Sand had been all over the boat. With renewed optimism, the crew applauds. Fraser, Peters, and Tobin enter the sub that hasn't flooded but they are unable to remove their suits because the air inside the sub has turned into chlorine gas. They discover a number of skeletons, some clearly the victims of suicide and others chained. When Tobin inquires as to whether this was a prison sub, Peters is horrified to inform him that it appears that cannibalism occurred right before these men's lives came to an end. The drive shaft is located, and Peters and Tobin start to remove it. Fraser laughs in or as he looks ahead and discovers a stack of the gold they were looking for. The three ask for the pulley system to start moving after loading the drive shaft, but the mud is deep, and the cart can only go so far. The three start to exert pressure on it to move, albeit slowly. Robinson is informed by Morozov that the winch is pulling with four tons of force. Robinson understands that they are also attempting to move the gold. Peters is aware that they are approaching a cliff that will cause everything to fall, but Fraser is adamant about keeping the gold. Daniel screams in fear and orders them to leave the gold, but Robinson tells Fraser that if he can move the cart away from the cliff, it is his decision. Although they lose a few gold bars in the process, Fraser and Peters are using metal rails to move and turn the car. Peters climbs up the cliff's edge to try to turn it, but as he does so, he tumbles off and cuts off his air supply. He is killed when he plunges to the ocean's floor. Fraser is horrified by this because he has never lost a man while diving. Fraser and Tobin go back to the submarine. The crew is now down to the bare minimum of nine men, which is required to operate the sub. 
Daniels requests a private meeting with Robinson but cannot because he lacks experience. Robinson hears the truth from Daniels that Lewis was just an actor. No well-off benefactor existed. This expedition was funded by his former company, Agra. Robinson was purposefully fired because they were unable to reach the gold in order to inspire him to pursue it. The Georgian government and Agra have already agreed to split the gold in half. They were expected to receive nothing when the crew surfaced. Robinson finds it hard to believe since Kirsten was the one who first told him about Lewis. According to Daniels, Agra paid Kirsten £8.30,000 to inform Robinson about the position. Robinson then understands that his friend killed himself out of guilt. Robinson is furious with Daniels because people have died for this expedition, and Robinson brought Tobin along even though he is just a young child who will soon become a father. Daniels offers his apologies, but Robinson simply hands him his belt to shut the door and begs God to help him if he can get past that. Robinson tries to calm the crew down, but they want to kill Daniels for betraying them. They are aware that if they surface, Agra or the Navy will be waiting for them, ready to take the gold and render their ordeal useless. Robinson suggests that they land in Turkey, where they can dock safely and navigate around a few coves. Robinson advises them that they have two options, give up and be treated like the spoiled brats, Agra and Daniels, who used them all or take a little more risk and fight for the lives they truly deserve. Robinson declares, I'm not going home poor, not after this. The crew uses the torpedo tubes to bring in the gold and modifies the drive shaft so that it operates on their sub. Robinson totals the gold and calculates that they have more than 182 million, and this time they will be able to divide it among themselves. Robinson makes it clear that he is going to assist Daniels by ordering him to leave the room in which he has barricaded himself. Daniels tells Fraser that Robinson is losing it as he tries to reason with him. Daniels tries to use the I have kids car to get Fraser to listen, but Fraser ignores him. The crew starts the boat and ascends from the bottom of the ocean. They level out and maintain stability as Reynolds and Tobin steer the boat. When everyone has arrived at their posts, they start to move. However, Barber orders a full stop after hearing something up ahead while performing his sonar duties. They halt in fear of rocks. They discover they have lost their way and are in the middle of a confined cove when Moreovers and Robinson. Robinson will not take the chance of losing time by turning around. The men will pass through the cove, he assures them. The men object, but Robinson argues that since they are only a few hours away from being sentenced to death, isn't a little bit more risk not worth it. The men go on, despite Daniel's objections. Tobin tells Robinson that all he wants right now is to live. Robinson growls, go back to your fucking posts. Finally agreeing, the men move through the cove. Daniel starts nagging Fraser to murder one of the men. If they lose another man, they will be forced to surface the boat. Fraser starts to lose control. The boat collides with the cove wall and starts rubbing against it. Robinson claims that once they have traversed the first 30 meters, everything will be fine. Daniels keeps muttering to Fraser about how Robinson is crazy. Fraser tampers with the device and signals Sitsev to take a look. Fraser beats his head in with a wrench while turning his back on him. The moment everyone saw the blood on Fraser's face, they all scoffed at Daniels and Fraser's account of Sitsev having hit his head and dying. Robinson refers to Daniels as stupid and says, you fucking killed him Daniels, after finally seeing him for the man he really is. One of the other Russians tries to figure out what went wrong and fix it in the meantime. Inadvertently setting off an explosion that kills him and damages the sub, 
which sends it plunging to the bottom. The crew is scurrying about, wondering where the ocean's bottom is. At 350 meters, the sub finally descends to crush depth. The explosion has caused the sub to begin filling with water. Tobin is knocked out cold when a gasket bursts as he, Robinson, Fraser, and some of the other men are attempting to apply pressure to the leak in the engine room. Robinson notices him as he is submerged and is unable to leave him to perish. While being dragged outside the room, he starts performing CPR with the aid of Morozov. Reynolds, Fraser, and Barber, the other crew members still inside the engine room, are trapped and will drown as a result of Daniels leaving the room and starting to close the door. Daniels locks the door while deliberately approving their demise. Reynolds and Barber make every effort to hold out as long as they can while Fraser drowns. Barber is killed in a mini-explosion that results from the lights breaking. Reynolds was last spotted submerged and on the verge of drowning. Daniels closes two more compartments, but his belt jams the door of the second one, trapping him. When Morozov notices him by himself, he realizes that he left the others to perish. Daniels claims he was at a loss for options and requests a knife to cut the belt loose. Just as he allowed the others to die, Morozov abandons him to perish. As the water starts to fill the room where Daniels is, he cries out in vain. Robinson is able to revive Tobin back in the torpedo room. Tobin takes deep breaths while coughing up water. Are we still in this location? Tobin queries. Robinson responds, I, I apologize. Daniel drowns when the room he is in is filled with water. The crew has been reduced to three when Morozov returns to the torpedo room. According to Morozov, the crew has perished and the submarine has been lost. Robinson reveals that the three suits he discovered before they left port are escape suits and takes them out of the bag. Morozov is rightfully furious that he kept the crew in the dark about the suits, but Robinson responds that there weren't enough for everyone, and he didn't want them to lose hope. Morozov almost attacks Robinson because of his selfishness and the fact that most of Robinson's crew and all of Morozov's crew perished, but he eventually gathers himself because he has no other choice. The suits were put on by Tobin and Morozov. Tobin inquires about the price of a single gold bar. Robinson estimates 500,000. Robinson replies that they can't because it would make the suits too heavy when Tobin asks if they can at least bring one inside the suits. Robinson gives Tobin a quick hug. He declares, you be there for your boy, that's all that matters. Robinson assures them that he will put them in the torpedoes and launch them before using an emergency lever to flee. Morozov gives him an odd expression and then nods. Robinson sends the tubes that Tobin and Morozov have entered out to the surface. Robinson looks at the gold he gave everything to obtain. Morozov and Tobin succeed in reaching the surface. Tobin is waiting for Robinson to arrive but Morozov reveals that there was no way for him to get away because he gave his life to ensure their survival. When Tobin realizes it, he sobs. Robinson puffs on a cigarette as he waits for the water to breach the gold and suffocate him. As he waits for the end, he imagines his family in better times. Tobin and Morozov can see the third suit hit the surface from back on the surface. Although Tobin is shocked to see the gold and a photo of Robinson's family inside, he initially believes it to be Robinson. Robinson apparently used his suit to send the gold up for the two survivors before the ship was completely submerged because he apparently did not want everyone to have died for nothing and to make sure Tobin can support his new family. We want to extend our heartfelt thanks for taking the time to watch our Black Sea 2014 video. Our aim is to provide you with informative and engaging content, and we hope we've succeeded in doing so.
If you're interested in delving deeper into the topic or buying the product that we've featured, please don't hesitate to click the link in the description below. By using our affiliate link, not only are you supporting our channel, but you also gain access to exclusive discounts and deals that are unavailable to the general public. Don't miss out on this amazing opportunity, click the link now. If you found this video entertaining, we would greatly appreciate your support through liking, commenting, and subscribing to our channel. We strive to offer you the best value and assistance possible. Once again, thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in our next video.